is where you're going to be. Growing up in the Howard household, there were times when we needed to have a family discussion. Just something that, that my parents felt that, that as a family we needed to sit down and, and then talk. Now, I know times have changed since I was a kid growing up, but in our household, as often as possible, we ate our meals together. And we would wait until everybody got home to eat the evening meal so that we could eat it together. And our meals were always eaten at the table. So as we would sit around the, the kitchen table, sometimes my parents would say, we need to have a discussion. Now, in our household, we called regroup sessions. So, so if my mom or dad said, we're having a regroup session, we knew that was time for a family discussion. And most of the time, those took place around the supper table. Now, thinking back about that, I can't tell you the number of times we had a family discussion. It wasn't every night. It probably wasn't even every month. But it was just with something important we needed to talk about. I can't even really tell you the subjects of our family discussions. They've been too long ago. But as I sat in my office thinking about those family discussions, I wrote down three things that I remember. It was kind of like the unspoken rules of our family discussions. Rule number one was truth was always spoken. When we had family discussions, it wasn't a time for goofing off. It wasn't a time for, for silliness. It, it, was, it was a time to speak truth. Rule number two Discussion was always open and honest. It was not a time to pretend. It was a time to, to, be, to be honest in a discussion. And rule number three is the one that, that I, I remember the most. It is that love continued no matter what the discussion topic was. Because I can tell you, some of those family discussions probably wasn't good for me. They were, might have been about me. But love always continued after that. Back whenever I began to prepare for our February uh, message topics, I kind of wish that we could all just sit around the kitchen table. I, I wish that, that, that it was a way for us to just gather around the supper table and talk. Because, you see, February is the month of love, right? And everybody's already thinking about, you know, what am I, am I going to get a Valentine? You know, is my sweetie going to do something special this year? You know, they have it for the last 75. But maybe this year's the year. And, and, and we, you know, we're, we're starting to think of those things. And, and you walk through the store and you see the hearts and, and the candy. And, and one guy just looked at his wife and says, it's about love. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, we're, we're, we see it. So we're, so we're thinking about relationships. So for the month of February, I want to talk about our relationships. And I'll give you the, the itinerary. I want to start with talking about our relationship with God. I want to next week, we're going to talk about our relationship with our spouse. In week three, we're going to talk about our relationships with our children. And then in our fourth week, we're going to talk about our relationships with our church, within our church. And so, so that's kind of what the, the ideas that I had. And, and as I thought about that, I thought... What do we say? Because here's the deal. In each of these categories, or each of these relationships, I see things in today's church that has me very, very concerned. I, I see things, whether we're talking about our relationship with God, with our spouse, with our kids, or even within our church, I see things in Christians today. And I'm not necessarily just talking about our church, just in, in general, maybe. I see things that really have me concerned. And I tell you, I'm not an expert on any of them. There's not a, one of these relationships that I can say, you know, I'm not like the Apostle Paul that says, do what I do. Because I can tell you, I have made my share of mistakes in every one of those, and I still make those mistakes. So, so I'm not coming up as an expert, but... There's just some things in our relationships as Christians that I'm really concerned about. I see a lot of folks who claim Jesus, 
But when you look at their relationships, they don't really portray Jesus. So, so here's what I want to do. Throughout this month, we're going to pretend. We're, we're going to pretend that, that we're, we're sitting around the supper table. And we're having family discussion. And, and I, I promise you, our discussion is going to be truthful. It's going to be open and honest. And we're going to continue to love one another, even after our discussion. So, so as we look at this, I want us to look at it. And today I want us to start with our relationship with God. I started to actually just bring in a, a dining room table and set it up. And, you know, I pretend, so this is going to be our table. This is my seat. This is yours. I want us to just pretend that we're, we're having a family discussion. Now, when you think about your relationship with God, and, and we're thinking about someone in the Bible that has a great relationship with God, who, who's somebody that comes to your mind? Okay, David. Who else? I can't, I, too many people want me. Samuel, John. Who else? Jesus, <laughs> that's a crazy symbol. <laughs> Who else? Somebody else. What do you think of? Solomon. Solomon. Okay, so, so we, we think about these, and, and there's so many folks that we can think about. And we say, that would be, in their life, they were great examples for us to, to pattern our lives by. Because they had great relationships with God. Well, I can tell you, my first thought was David. And the reason I thought of David is, is the way Scripture describes David. Scripture describes David as being a man after God's own heart. Now, the first time, twice in the Bible, he's described that way. But the first time was actually by Samuel, God's priest at, at that time. And, and just to kind of set that setting for our passage this morning, say, uh, Saul was the king. Saul was not really a godly king. He was not following God. He was not doing the things God. And because of that, Israel wasn't being blessed. Now, right before our passage today, Saul was getting ready to go to war. And he's going to go to war. And he knows that for victory, he needs God's blessing. So, so he has it up about him. He knows that. So before he goes off to war, he wants to offer a sacrifice asking for God's blessing. But, but Saul's ready and, and he waits for seven days. But the prophet Samuel never showed up to offer the sacrifice. So, so Saul is like, you know, no, kind of in his head, he's, you know, well, if I go to war without God's blessing, we're going to lose. So he goes ahead and offers the sacrifice. And, and about the time he finishes the sacrifice and the prayers, Samuel shows up. And, and Samuel says, what have you done? Because you see, Saul had now assumed the role of the priest. And then Samuel says, what have you done? And, and he proceeds to tell Saul that Saul is going to be replaced as king. And there's going to be a new king of God's people. And that kind of brings us to where we we're, we're going to look at today. And, and the passage we're going to look at is in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. So if you're there. Let's start at verse 13. Here's what it says. You did a foolish thing, Samuel told Saul. You didn't follow the command of the Lord your God. If you had, now listen to this. If you had, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel permanently. But now your kingdom will not last. The Lord has searched for a man after his own heart. The Lord has appointed him as ruler of his people because you didn't follow the command of the Lord. Now the one that, that Samuel's talking about here that's going to replace Saul is David. And, 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 and God told Samuel that it's a man after my heart. For 
for the last, I can't tell you how many months, if you had the opportunity to look into my journal, you would see one consistent line, one, one consistent thing that I, I, I pray continually. And my prayer is this, Lord, I want to be a man after your heart. David is described as a man after God's own heart. And I'm assuming that, that men and women of God have that same desire. You want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. Now, if we, as we think of David, and, and I know some of you are already thinking of some of the stories of David, and you're thinking... I don't know how David's a man after God's own heart with some of the things he did. So one day last week, I, I, I put on Facebook and I said, you know, I'm going to be preaching on David. What story do you think I'm going to be preaching from? And I was amazed that and folks that were giving me answers and some were private messaging me and some just put them out for everybody to see. But, but, but I had guesses like, you know, David and Goliath or, or different things about David and Saul. I had somebody say, you know, David and the prophet Nathan, and, and, and the way that, that Nathan responded to David. Uh, God's covenant with David, what was somebody's answer? Somebody said, you know, or a few people said, David is king, or David and Bathsheba. Well, the truth is, in every story we find about David, we see how David truly was a man after God's own heart. Every one of these stories, no matter what you thought of, the good ones or the bad ones, if we go through that story, we will see why David was a man after God's own heart. So this morning, I want us to look at four things. And, and basically, we're going to look at four things from the life of David that, that, that we need to examine in our lives so that we can be a man after God's own heart. So let's jump right into it. Number one, from the life of David, we see genuine faith. Genuine faith. And, and the, one of the stories that came to my mind when I thought about the, the faith of David was the story of David and Goliath. Now, I'm sure, especially if you were a child in Sunday school, you remember the story of David and Goliath. You know, how... how Israel's at war with the Philistines, and they're kind of at a stalemate because they're here at the Valley of Ella, and, 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 and the Philistines are on one hilltop, and the Israelites are on the other hilltop. And the thing is, for any one of them to advance, it's a suicide mission. You know, if the Israelites would say, let's go get them, and they'd start down, the Philistines could just pick them off. If the Philistines would say, let's the, the, the charge, you know, they start down on their side of the hill, the Israelites could just pick them off in the valley. So, so it's, it's almost like they're in a stalemate. Nobody wants to back up, but nobody really wants to go forward. Because whichever army advances, it's probably going to lose. So then the Philistines come up with a challenge. And they say, how about... Knowing that, that it's a suicide mission for whichever army that goes, why don't each army send their best fighter, their best soldier, they'll meet in the middle, they'll fight it out to the death, and whoever wins will be the winner, and whoever loses will be the, the, the slave of the winner. All right, you know, it's better than losing the whole army, so who we got that's going to go? Now, the problem was the Philistine champion was Goliath from Gath. And Goliath wasn't an ordinary soldier. He was like nine foot six inches tall. He, he, he was like a mountain. His, his spear was like a fence post with a point on it. I mean, this guy was huge. He, and somebody else had to help carry his armor. He, he was just that big. Nobody in Israel wanted to fight him. And every morning, Goliath would come out on the hilltop, and, 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 and you know, he, would, he would offer the challenge. He was going to fight me today. And you know, almost picture him going out there and hollering, feed five, foe, foe. I mean, this guy was that big. And, and, and 
you know, the Israelites, they'd all get on their battle lines and it's like, okay, who's going to fight me? Not me. Because it was like an impossible task. No ordinary human could take on this great big giant. Well, three of David's brothers were, were in the Israelite army. So, so David would, would bring them provisions. And, and one day his father said, you know, I want you tomorrow to go and take these provisions to my brother, your brother, see how the, the war is going on and come back and tell me. So David, he gets his stuff and he goes uh, to, to, out to take them. And, and he gets there just in time for the, for the morning challenge. You know, the Israelites are at their battle lines, the Philistines are at their, and Goliath steps forward and says, who's going to fight me today? And he watches as the Israelite army kind of just backs up. And David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should challenge the army of the living God? It was almost like the rest of the soldiers went, oh. David says, I'll fight him. And, and you're probably familiar with the story. He goes and, 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 you know, they try to put Saul's armor on him, and they, that wasn't going to work. He wasn't used to that. It was too heavy for him, and, you know, he, he's, a, he's a boy. So he goes into battle with just his sling and, and five stones that he chose to take with him. First Samuel chapter 17, uh, starting at verse 45, says it records what David said as he goes to battle with Goliath. He says, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the army of Israel, who you have insulted. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. And David killed Goliath. Now when we, we think of that story, we see David's faith in God. David knew he couldn't do it. But he knew the God of the, the Israel's army could defeat that giant. So, so you think, well, what really is faith? I'm going to give you Pastor Dan's definition of faith. Faith is total confidence. It's total confidence that, that, that David said, I have faith. I have total confidence in my God that he can defeat that great big giant. When we put our faith in God, the Bible calls it belief. Belief isn't just something from your head. Belief is putting total confidence in God that God can. When we believe on God for salvation, we're putting total confidence in God that through his son Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, we can be saved. So, so faith is, is total confidence. David is going into a battle that is impossible for him to win. But he is confident that God not only can, but God will bring victory in the battle. That's faith. One of the biggest problems that Christians have today is we place our faith in God. But when we're facing giants, we think God can handle it. We think God will take care of it. But we're not confident that he can. We're not confident that he will. He said, well, Pastor Dan, that looks ridiculous. Well, think about it. How many times when we're facing our giants, just those giants in life, maybe it's an anger issue, maybe it's a marriage issue, maybe, it, maybe it's an addiction. But we're facing our giants in life, and we're calling out to God, God help me with this giant. But at the same time, we're trying to do our thing to fix it ourselves. We think God can. We think God will. But we're not confident Enough to trust him. Uh, and what that is, is, is doubt. Faith. Faith is total confidence in God. David, as a man after God's own heart, showed that he had faith in God. Well, let me show you another attribute of, of David 
being a man after God's own heart. And then my second one is complete trust. David completely trusted God. Now, when I said that, it wasn't just words. It wasn't just David saying, Lord, I trust you. Because how often do we do that? Lord, I trust you. And it's followed by, but. Lord, I trust you, but I'm going to do this. Lord, I trust you, but I'm going to take these precautions. Lord, I, David completely trusted God. Let me give you another story from David's life. One where he proved that he trusted that God was completely in control. David had already been anointed as king of Israel by, by Samuel. He, so he knew he was going to be the king, but Saul was still the king. Now, for, for David to, to actually be king, Saul had to be out of the picture. And that day didn't mean he retired. It meant he was permanently retired. Uh, he'd have to die. Now, David could have said, okay, God's anointed me. I'm the king of Israel. Let's go knock off Saul. I've got God's blessing. It's going to happen. But David trusted God enough to know that if God had made him king of Israel, God was going to take care of that obstacle in the path of him being that king. God was going to take care of Saul. So David refused to kill Saul. And it wasn't that he didn't have an opportunity. In one of those places in 1 Samuel chapter 24, and I love this story, it's kind of funny. So Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, if you know what I mean. And so, so while he's in the cave do, what he, doing his business, what he didn't know was David was hiding in that cave. So while Saul's doing his thing, David sneaks up and cuts the bottom of his robe off and then sneaks back. And then he, he, he yells at Saul. You know, after Saul gets done, he goes back to his army. He goes, hey, check out your robe. Now, David had a perfect opportunity. Hey, you know, <laughs> Saul's doing his thing. I'm going to be king. You know, I, but David didn't do that. And here's why. I want you to think about what, what David said. 1 Samuel 24, verses 12 and 13. He says, may the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Now, remember the problem that Saul had at the beginning when we started talking? Saul didn't wait on God. After seven days, he said, I'm going to make that sacrifice myself so we can have God's blessing and we can go into battle and win. David was different. David completely trusted God. To, to the point where he was willing to wait on God that whatever God's timing, that that's when God's will would be accomplished. So, so if we think about David's trust, watch the question, what is trust? Well, here's Pastor Dan's definition of trust. Trust is complete assurance. I, I think trust is just that complete assurance. If I were to ask every one of you before we started, do you trust God? I'm sure every person in this place would have said, yes, we trust God. But if we really trust God, then why do we try to take matters into our own hands when God's told us something? Why, why do we try to do it our way? And here's what I find we often do. We often substitute other things, other good things, in place of what God wants. Rather than just trusting him. God says, tell others about Jesus. So what we do, rather than telling others about Jesus, we say, well, I I'm going to be a positive example before them. We're not really doing what God wants us to do his way. Because we're not trusting him enough that he's going to be with us. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to substitute. And this is what I'm going to do there. 
He had got us assembled together as Christians. Well, I'll, I'll have my own church. And, and I'll have it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, and, and what we're doing, we're substituting what God wants. God says, live for me. I'll be a perfect Christian in church. But when I go to work tomorrow, or when I go to school tomorrow, I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, what we're doing is we're substituting. This is what God says. We don't really want to do it what God says. So we put something else in its place, something good, so we can feel good about ourselves. God says, serve me this way. We kind of really don't have time to serve you this way. You know how busy I am. I've got all this going on. So I'll serve you this way and this way instead. What David teaches us is that trust is a complete assurance that God's going to take care of it. And God's going to take care of us if we do it his way. So if we're going to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, we have to ask ourselves, what area of my life am I not completely trusting let me give you a third thing that I find in David's life. A uh, third thing. And I'm going to call it honest integrity. From just the stories that we see in David's life, when we find this honest integrity, 1 Samuel chapter 22 tells a story of David lying to Ahimelech, the priest. And, and, and David did that so that he could get food for his men and so that he could get this, the sword of, of Goliath. But the result of that lie, because of the lie, Saul come in and killed 85 of the priests and wiped out almost the entire village of Nod. All because David lied. You say, well, if David lied, how could he be a man after God's own heart? Here's what happened. When David learns about this, David admits his wrong immediately. Well, that's a good thing. That's what he should do. But how many times do we actually do that? We try to cover it up. David, when, when, when he, find his, he realizes his wrong, and he realizes this is on me, he admits his wrong immediately. And he, he tried to do what he could to make it right. There was one person who survived the massacre of God. So David takes that person, brings them into his own home, and, and, and takes care of that person. David's trying to do everything in his power to make right what he did wrong. That's integrity. So, so I thought, how, how can I describe it? And really, I, I, I don't really know another way to describe integrity, so here's what I come up with. This is Pastor Dan's definition of integrity. Ethical Honesty. Even though David had did what was wrong, he did all he could to ethically make it right. That's why David's a man after God's own heart. We live in a world that teaches us that it's important for us to make ourselves look good. Now, now isn't that the world we live in? It, it's all about us. It's about what I want. It's about my wishes, my desires. It's about everybody looking and glorifying me. That's what our world teaches. So instead of owning up to our spiritual flaws, and let's face it, we all have them. Instead of owning up to them, we try to cover them up maybe with a lie or with an excuse. We, we try to make them someone else's fault. Well, I'd be a better Christian if it wasn't for such and such. Now, we don't come out and say it that way, but we kind of point it that way. Let me give you an example. I had a teenager one time years ago tell me they didn't get anything out of the youth class because the teacher didn't teach them anything. And I was like, OK. 
okay. And, you know, I talked to some of the other teenagers, and they were telling about what they learned in class, and you know, it was biblical and everything. So, so I, I kind of checked into that a little bit. And the truth was, that teenager, teenager didn't get anything out of the youth class because they were only in the class less than 50% of the time. And when they were in the class, they refused to participate in the class. And their focus was on everything but the class. They, they were, when they were in the class, their focus was more on the things about them. They, they would sit in the youth class, and they finally admitted this. I go in the class knowing that I'm not going to learn anything. You see the problem? What we have to do is have that ethical honesty to say, sometimes it's not the rest of the world. I've had people tell me they didn't get anything out of the worship service. And, and folks, we could spend until tonight with me giving you the reasons why they didn't get anything out of the worship service. But I've often wondered, would they get something out of the worship service if they stayed off their phone during the service? Well, would they get something out of the worship service if they didn't spend their time? I've seen adults coloring in the bulletin that we have for the five-year-olds. Just have. Maybe I have four adults just put the bulletin down. <laughs> I didn't get anything out of the worship service. That preacher sat the whole time he talked. Preachers are supposed to stand. I actually had a person tell me one time, I, I didn't wear my tie. And they couldn't focus on the sermon because I didn't have a tie on. <laughs> I wonder if being a man after God's own heart isn't having that ethical honesty to say, maybe there's something in me that needs to change. David realized this was on him. He realized he'd gotten people killed. And he took the responsibility for his actions. Rather than trying to blame somebody else. Or trying to excuse it away. Or trying to ignore it. If we're going to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. We need honest integrity. Let me give you the fourth thing real quick. And if I have to tell you, I think this is the most important. For David to be a man after God's own heart, he also had to practice absolute forgiveness. Probably the most well-known story of David's life is David and Bathsheba. And in that story, the wrongs of David just keep piling one on top of another. David's not where he's supposed to be. He's not off to war with his men. Being at home where he wasn't supposed to be, he sees this woman taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. He looks again. He begins to lust after this woman. He has someone go bring her to him. He sleeps with her. Now, she's a married woman. Bathsheba ends up getting pregnant. So, so David brings her husband in from the battlefield. So it's all doing what David should be doing. Brings him in. You know, give me the report. Now, now go home with your wife tonight. The guy wouldn't do it. He said, I can't go home with my wife when all my buddies are out there and they don't get to be with their wives. So he didn't do it. Two nights he didn't go. Well, that plan isn't going to work. So David sends the order. He ends up getting the guy killed. So that after the period of time for grieving, he, he could take Bathsheba to be his wife. David, David tried to cover up his sin. And it was more sin and just multitudes of sin. And when we look at that story, we ask the question, how could David be a man after God's own heart? I mean, here we've seen lust, we've seen uh, adultery, we've seen murder, we've seen, you know, the list goes on and on. How could David be a man after God's own heart? And if we stopped there with the story, we'd say he couldn't be a man after God's own heart. But the story doesn't end there. 
God knows, even though David's covered it up so nobody else will know except for him and that woman. God knows. And God sends the prophet Nathan to, to confront him. And, and Nathan tells him this, this story about sheep and, and, and just draws David in. And David is furious and he's ready to go after some guy. And then David, Nathan says, you're a man. It's you. And David realizes at that point in time that God knows about his death. And if you want to read one of the most awesome passages of Scripture, this afternoon read Psalm 51. Because Psalm 51 is David's cry for forgiveness. As he calls out to God and says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a right spirit. I don't deserve to, to be with you. David sought forgiveness. Friends, God already knows we're sinners. He knows that, that because of our human nature, we have that inward inclination for sin. But what makes the difference is what do we do with that sin? Do we try to cover it up? Do we try to overcome it? Do we try to just forget about it and it'll go away? Or do we seek absolute forgiveness? Today, as we sat around our supper table, we're talking about our relationship with God. And I wonder, how many of us around the table today, we're not talking about anybody else, how many of us around the table today are trying to plead God with sin in our lives? How many of us are trying to please God today without being ethical in our integrity? How many of us are trying to please God today but we won't completely trust in what He tells us to do? How many of us around the table today say, I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a woman after God's own heart. But we're not totally putting our confidence in God. As I look around our churches, as I see men and women who claim Jesus, I see a lot of us are lacking. A lot of us are not. We want to be a man after God's own heart. But we're not really willing to get rid of the self in order to do that. And maybe this morning, God's Spirit's already speaking to you. And maybe you're thinking of an area of your life or part of your life where there's something that keeps hanging on. I can tell you, my desire for quite some time has been to be a man after God's own heart. And you all know me well. You know I'm not there. I have my fault. There are many nights in my journal that I write, Lord, I want to be a man after your heart. It's so hard. So here, here, I want to challenge you with the way I've challenged myself. What is one area of your life that today you can surrender to God? One area, just one. And you can begin with that area. Maybe it's faith. Maybe it's trust. Maybe it's integrity. Maybe it's forgiveness. But what's one area 
one aspect that you can say to God, God, I want to be a man. I want to be a woman after your heart. And today, I want to start here. As we pray this morning, can we just take a moment and let's just each one of us take that prayer to God. I want to be a man. I want to be a woman after your heart. And today, Lord, I want to start. Let's pray together. Father God, our desire, the, the desire of every believer is to be that person after your heart. But Lord, it is so hard. And we struggle so much. And because of that, our relationship with you isn't what it should be. So Lord, today we come to you with this declaration. Today I want to start with this area of my life. to build, to strengthen, to grow in that relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand with us, please, as we sing.